Yeah, Val Gooding recently retired from Bupa after 10 successful years. Uh, prior to that, her early career was spent at BA, where she spent over a quarter of a century, latterly as Regional Director for Asia. And Val has been a very successful female CEO and was recognised by Fortune in 2005 as being the 16th most powerful woman in the world. And she was also knighted in 2002. And Val's sharing her secrets of being a CEO. But anyway, Val, th thanks for this. I just wanted to ask you some questions for the Secrets of CEOs book and get, get your point of view. Um, the first question is, there's a lot of focus now about the war for talent. Mm. You know, how do you think companies should wa wage the war for talent? Do you think it's an, it's an important thing to be doing right now? Yes, I think it is very important because obviously attracting and retaining the right people and having them well motivated is really the key ingredient for a successful company. I think uh, the way, some of the ways that people go about that are, are very scientific and complicated, but I think one thing that's seriously underestimated is making your business a nice place to work. Right. And you, you found that at <coughs> Bupa? Did you, you invest in doing that at Bupa? Oh, absolutely, yes. Because if you want people to stay with you and do their best every day and feel, you know, excited and anticipation when they get out of bed every morning to go to work, I think it's really important to make it a nice place to work, make people enjoy it, give people stretching goals, congratulate them, support them, and I think sometimes those things are seriously underestimated yeah. in the war for talent. Is there anything in terms of um, acquiring talent that, 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 that you want to that you sort of highlight or you know, maybe in work, the way you work with the search firms? Yes, I think um, when we do external searches um, for, for companies that I've worked for, I think it's very, very important the going in point, getting the specification right. I think yeah. that's incredibly important. And I think being open-minded and giving the search firm as much information as possible about where your business is going, what your strategy is, I think that's very important in terms of finding the right people. Yeah. Okay. And, and when you were leading Booper, could you talk a bit about how you led it? What was your sort of leadership style? You know, there seems from the interviews of the CEOs we've had so far, you know, there's a very there's big divergence in style. What, what yes. typifies your style? Yes, well, I like to think I was an inclusive leader um, that I led from the front. I was articulate about where the company was going and our strategy and what was expected of people. But once those goals were established and, and laid out and people understood them, I'm a great believer in giving people as much autonomy as possible yeah. within their role, whether they're senior executives or indeed whether they're people in the front line in our call centres or something like that, giving people as much autonomy to make decisions and meet customers' expectations from their own decision-making yeah. authority, I think is, is very, very important. Because a lot of companies have struggled, you know, they, they seem a lot of companies work in a command and control way. Mm. And, and how do you, I suppose it's, try, how do you balance giving freedom to people who are serving the clients with managing performance at the same time? Yes, uh, I think you can do that if you set the boundaries at the outset and you're clear about what the goals and targets are. But I think one thing I would say about command and control from my experience in business is there are occasions when command and control is absolutely the only way to manage. Yeah. Um, for example, if your company's in crisis, if, it, if it's uh, financially significantly underperforming or threatened or whatever, or for example, in the aviation business, which as you said, I worked in before I was at Bupa, um, if you had an incident, an aircraft incident or a security thing or a terrorist incident or something, Obviously, that is not the time for being <laughs> inclusive. That's the yeah. time when you need very clear, dynamic leadership because you're making real-time decisions. Yeah. It's not a time for sitting around and brainstorming, so what shall we do next? Yeah. So, <laughs> so actually, I think it's all about situations that, that your business faces. Okay. And then if you think going forward into the future and, and operating more international, more global businesses, mm -hmm. I know you, you worked out in... In Asia for BA, didn't you? Yes, I was responsible for the Asia Pacific right. region, yes, for okay. a period, yeah. So, so, so any view about how, how to manage a more sort of global footprint, you know, in that yeah. less command and control way? Yes, well, that is something we dealt with at Bupa because we internationalised the company over the 10 years that I was CEO. 
So we had um, a big business in Australia where Bupa is the number one health insurer in that market now and the number two in Spain and sort of businesses in, in Asia and America and so on as well. So we, we were grappling with that sort of problem of, it's not exactly globalizing, because mm. I think that implies you're everywhere, yeah. but internationalizing the business. And I think what's important there is having, again, very clear lines of communication and delegated authority, having very clear targets and goals, making it absolutely crystal clear what, what the values and policies of the company are and where you do have freedom to operate within those policies provided you meet yeah. the targets. So I think a lot of it is about setting out your stall very clearly yeah. at the beginning and a, about um, giving people the maximum autonomy even if they're in Australia. Yes. Yeah. And that free freedom to localise, isn't it? Is, is it yes, yeah. trying to adapt your, your product, your service, your style of operating according to the country that you're in, because although they speak English, yeah. it is very different in yeah. Australia than it is here. And sometimes people think it's all Anglo-Saxon, it's the same, but it really isn't the same. And I think being able to adapt and appointing the right sort of people, um, a mix maybe of locals, and expatriates who are working alongside each other, who really understand that it's all about meeting the needs of, of customers in that location, and not necessarily about doing something in a very rigid yes. way that yes. is a one size fits all. Yeah, which yeah. unfortunately many companies have done. <laughs> um, yes, and sometimes yeah. it works, I guess. I think it depends what kind of sector you're in, but mm. in health, um, health is very different in every country in the world and if you want to be successful in each market you've got to totally adapt what you do to yeah. meet the needs of that market and those customers so I think that's very important. Yeah, I think you're right. Well, you, you've been a CEO for, for, for how many years now? Ten years, Ten years. as CEO, yeah. So, so based on that experience what would your advice be for other people now aspiring to CEOs? Yes, I think um, one of the things that I had to do, lo lots, lots of times people would see that I'd been a CEO for 10 years yeah. and say, oh, you've been very successful, how did you do that? But there were long periods of my career where it was very slow progress. Yeah. So one thing I would say is be patient and don't be in too much of a hurry because it's very, very important the experience you gain on the way up. Um, both you know, in a vertical sense, but also in a horizontal sense by working in different disciplines, in different sectors, in different yeah. industries and gaining as much experience as possible. I think another thing I would say to aspiring CEOs is um, make sure you know a lot about what's going on in the business world in general as well as in your sector. Make sure you're well yeah. informed and also learn from watching other people. Um, you can learn as much from a poor CEO as you can from yeah. a good CEO, in my experience. <laughs> I agree. Um, and then, you know, in that 10 year period, how do you keep yourself grounded and fresh? You know, how do you stay fresh every day when you've got all those responsibilities? Yeah, I think it helps if you've got two stroppy teenage <laughs> sons who, when you go home, they say, oh, mum, that's rubbish, and get real, and you don't understand, and things like that. I think having a, a, a normalised sort of family situation is important, and having some other interests that are not totally about your business is, is very important. And I think it's also it's vital to have a few people on the team, because everybody won't be prepared to do this, but having a few people who will come into your office and say, you're absolutely wrong about this you shouldn't have said that, you yeah. should be thinking about doing this. And I think every CEO needs that. Yeah. And if you're not careful, the longer you've been in your job, the more respect people have for you if you're successful and the more reluctant they are to come and tell you when you've got it wrong. So you always need a few pieces of grit in the yeah. oyster, so yeah. to speak, people who will come along and say, you should think about this differently, you're wrong about yeah. that. I think it takes a lot of confidence for the CEO to have pe enough people around them like that. Yes, but in my opinion, you can't be a successful leader unless yeah. you are reasonably personally self-confident. That yeah. doesn't mean to say arrogant or overconfident, yeah. but you've got to have inner belief. If you haven't that, got that.